looks like Hume's approaching weapons high now. This government will never surrender to the IRA. Never. These people will never win. Democracy will triumph over evil. The intelligence we gathered for that job for the special branch was that um, two notorious players would be involved in a murder, an assassination. Mary belonged to the Army's secret undercover unit, 14 Intelligence Company, the eyes and ears of the SAS, the troop in Army language. I drove the troop in, five of them, in the back of a van, unmarked van, and basically I would take them in, drop them off. 14 Intelligence Company, the secret Army unit known as The Debt, were monitoring three AK-47s at a farm building in County Armagh. There was intelligence that two of the IRA's most wanted men, Martin McCaughey and Desi Grew, were coming to pick them up that night. The SAS were waiting. It was a quiet night, dark, very, very quiet and still. And the next thing was this thunderous roar of 7.62 fire going down. And um, it's very loud. You feel the jolt. It's it's not like watching it on TV when you just hear like a, a, a crack or a bang. This is like a kaboom. Several of them shattering the quietness of the night. Mr. McCaughey and Mr. Grew wouldn't have stood much of a chance, would they? They walked out of that barn carrying AK-47s walking in the direction of the troop guys. At the end of the day, they were terrorists on a mission. They chose that. And they met their maker. This program reveals how British intelligence tightened the net around the IRA and helped draw them into negotiations. The real war in Northern Ireland was the intelligence war. I mean, this was the main factor in reducing the IRA or preventing all of the atrocities that may have taken place. It was all down to the gathering of intelligence by the debt and other, and other agencies. In the mid-80s, the IRA intensified its campaign in the countryside, hoping to create liberated zones, no-go areas for the army and the police. They bombed police stations in East Tyrone and killed workmen who were sent to repair them. When they destroyed the Birches station, the bomb was in a JCB. Ballygawley suffered the same fate, with the IRA shooting dead two policemen inside. The IRA was brimful of confidence. The next target was the picturesque village of Loch Gaul, but this time British intelligence knew. The information came from a listening device, debt surveillance and, we understand, a special branch informer within the IRA unit. Seven SAS troopers and three special branch officers acted as decoys. Well, I volunteered uh, to go into Loch Gull Station. Uh, they asked for volunteers uh, from our, our unit to uh, go into the station for a period of time. And I said, yes, I would. John joined the RUC Special Branch and became a member of its anti-terrorist unit. We've concealed the identities of undercover agents in this series to protect their security. We went in on the night, the Thursday evening, just as darkness approached uh, we entered the station 
along with our army uh, colleagues. The SAS? The SAS, yes. Um, and we set up base at the station, got ourselves settled, and then we had out for further instructions. Where were you? We were probably about three or four miles out of Loch Hall on the back roads, just as the, all the debt were, just driving around, trying to pick up and give people an early warning as to what was happening. Anna joined 14 intelligence company The Debt in the 80s. And what did you see? We saw the van, uh, we saw the JCB, and initially we thought it had been stuck behind a slow moving vehicle. Loch Gull was a carbon copy of the Birches, a bomb in the bucket of a JCB. Its job was to smash through the station's flimsy defence. What goes through your mind when you see this JCB coming towards you? Bomb. I just thought of the Birches again, Valley Golly, and I was sitting right outside uh, the window of the, the police station. I heard gunfire. took cover, and then within seconds, a massive explosion. I find myself buried at the corner of the station, in rubble, inhaling dust and in darkness. Did you think you were going to survive? No. At that stage, I thought, I'm dead. Simple as that. I thought I was dead. And what's going through your head as you're listening to all this gunfire? For me and my partner, we were just very quiet. We were just wondering what happened, who had been killed, if we'd lost friends. Outside, the SAS were lying in wait, heavily outnumbering and outgunning the IRA's eight men. The SAS fired over 200 shots. One of them killed the special branch informer who was part of the unit. The van was riddled like a sieve. And there were eight dead IRA men. That's correct. That's a tragedy, but rather than three dead policemen, I think that's a better option. when you heard that there were eight IRA men dead? I think we could say that we're, we were jubilant again. We were, I was amazed that eight had actually been killed. But yeah, we, we were happy. We, we thought it was a job well done. My personal first reaction was uh, really one of, uh, of some satisfaction that, uh, that we had won one, as it were in, in the, this, this continual con conflict, that it was a, you know, a victory for the, the forces of law and order. What message did Loch Gaul and similar incidents send to the IRA? Uh, I hope it sent a message that uh, the British government was resolute and was going to, uh, going to fight them. It was the IRA's biggest loss in modern times. Among the dead were some of its most experienced and ruthless men. Republicans accused the Brits of murder, claiming the IRA unit need not have been mowed down in cold blood. Why wasn't the IRA unit intercepted? Well, my understanding is that the intelligence was not precise enough for people to know where these people were coming from, precisely who they were, and exactly when the attack would take place. And as it happened, the events unfolded with such rapidity, it clearly wasn't possible to intercept them before they embarked upon their attack. Why weren't they arrested? Well, again, these are people who attacked with such ferocity. They demolished the police station. They opened fire with a whole variety of weapons. Uh, so clearly it wasn't possible to arrest them in those circumstances through the circumstances that they had brought about. 
A few hundred yards from the police station, there was a white car. Two brothers were inside. They were innocent civilians caught up in the IRA attack and SAS ambush. How many times were you hit? Twelve times to the bike and a couple of times in the head. In the head? Uh-huh. Whereabouts in the head? The left hand side of it, on the bike. His brother Anthony was killed outright. The SAS fired 40 shots into the car. Do you remember your brother saying anything? Well, you bit of a shout, Oliver, Oliver, help me. Those were the last few words he said. Well, this is an absolutely unspeakable tragedy. But I have no doubt that that was brought about by a gang of people determined to engage in murder, determined to carry out a gun attack and a bomb attack. The SAS did the shooting, not the IRA. They killed Anthony Hughes. This is an absolutely unspeakable tragedy, and there's no words that can dilute uh, that. But I have no doubt where the responsibility and where the blame lies. The SAS thought it was an IRA car. It wasn't. The brothers were just returning home from work. When you look back on what happened, how do you think of that night? Well, I think it was uh, very unjust because they could have had a checkpoint and stopped us from going into that area. Told us the danger about sick place. But there was no checkpoint? No. I don't know how that would have been possible because the time scale wasn't known. I don't know how you could have brought the village life uh, to a stop not having detailed information at disposal. But wasn't the real reason why there was no cordon around the village is that a cordon would have alerted the IRA to the fact that something was afoot, that their plans were known? I'm certain that that isn't the case. I'm certain that had intelligence, had information been precise, then the planning could have been much more precise. Did anybody ever say sorry? No. Ministry of Defence? No. SAS? No. British Army? No. RUC? No. No apology? No. No apology. Informants remain the lifeblood of intelligence, and the army, as well as special branch, recruits and runs them. Their handlers belong to the force research unit, the FRU. It's so secret, it doesn't officially exist. Its motto, Fishers of Men, says it all. As much as anything, its fishers need nerve. You physically walk up to them. And say? And say, I want a word with you. Or hello, use his name. And say something like, I'm from British Intelligence. I want 20 seconds of your time. Don't panic. Don't run away. And hope that he stands still. If he doesn't, physically hold them. It wouldn't be the first time I was left with a duffel coat in my hands from one of them just taken off. Jeff joined the FRU in the mid-80s and handled both IRA and Loyalist agents. One of the agents he ran became notorious, a former British soldier from Belfast called Brian Nelson. By the early 70s, Nelson had left the army and joined the Loyalist paramilitaries of the UDA. In 1983, he offered his services to the FRU, but, disillusioned, left after a year and went to live in Germany. In 1986, the FRU brought him back, against the specific advice of MI5. Jeff became Brian Nelson's handler. We had set him up in that job. We had went to Germany, recruited him, promised him a house, 
had paid the deposit on a house brought him and his family back into this dangerous job. He arrived with a left-hand drive vehicle, which was totally unsuitable. He was given the deposit for another car and set up in a taxi firm. Were you involved in that rehabilitation here? Yes. Astonishingly, Nelson rapidly rose to become the UDA's intelligence chief. In theory, his job was to alert his handlers about the UDA's latest target. They, in turn, would inform the tasking and coordinating group, the TCG. The TCG operates from this office and consists of representatives from the agencies of British intelligence. They decide what action should be taken to thwart terrorist operations and thus save life. But it didn't always work out like that. Nelson didn't tell his handlers everything, and even when he did, their superiors didn't always act. Nelson gave the killers cards containing personal details of dozens of Republican suspects. He compiled them with the help of his handlers. Jeff now admits that his secret army unit actually aided and abetted in murder. On occasions, would you give him the kind of information he was looking for? No, but I would say to him, perhaps you, you don't have that wrong there. But if you confirm the vehicle registration, and if the person who owns that car is targeted by the yes. UDA, UFF, yes. and killed, then you're complicit in the killing of that person, aren't you? Because you've confirmed the registration number. That's, that's the real yes. difficulty. Well, it's a fine line you walk. But the secret unit didn't stop Nelson crossing that line. He's believed to have been involved in over a dozen killings. In the end, he pleaded guilty to five charges of conspiracy to murder. Three of those targeted survived. One was killed by mistake, and one was attacked in the middle of the night. His name was Gerard Slane. Nelson had supplied his photograph and file card to the killers. There was four gunmen, and I just took him down on the stairs, just gunned him down. Blood was all over the, the walls. In the end, things got too hot for both Nelson and the Fru. He was exposed as a British agent. The judge sentenced him to ten years for his part in planning murders. At his trial, the Fru's commanding officer paid tribute to Nelson's work. Jeff was of the same view. He saved, in my estimation, dozens of lives. He was essential to what I'll use the word, the war effort, and gave us an insight into the loyalist organisations that we never, ever had in the past, and I believe don't now. He was a jewel in the crown. But to Republicans, Brian Nelson was living proof of collusion, the instrument used by British intelligence to wipe out its enemies. The fact that Nelson usually tipped off his handlers cut no ice. Brian Nelson had warned his handler yeah. 11 days before your husband was killed and what is more, the day before your husband was killed, that he was being targeted. And yet the RUC never came to my door to tell me. Because my, my husband may have been here today, if not for the RUC. We don't know that the warning ever got to the RUC. But we do know, astonishingly from Jeff's own lips, that the Fru helped Nelson plan murder. Brian Nelson went to jail because... He was involved in conspiracies to murder. Yes, at our behest. He was encouraged to be involved in those conspiracies. Yes, he was. By you and your colleagues. Yes, he was. By the fruit. Yes. By British intelligence. Yes. Serve their purpose. Yes. And he went to jail. Yes. I am ashamed of it. He wasn't protected as was promised to him. Brian believed 
not that he was bulletproof, but that he had protection from us and that what he was doing, he was doing at our request and therefore he had immunity and he didn't. British intelligence relied not just on agents, but on blanket surveillance, in particular in the border areas of South Armagh. Here, in the IRA's most impenetrable stronghold, the debt couldn't mingle with the locals with the freedom it did elsewhere. In order to watch their movements, increasingly sophisticated technology took over, not just from the air, but also on the ground. Did you monitor IRA suspects on the other side of the border? Yes, we did. One particular one, yes. Which we were watching him for some two years. Two years? Two years. Ken served with the debt for a number of years. His speciality was high-tech surveillance. And what could you see? You could see... Well, we could read his number, number plate on his car. Let's put it that way. Using a large lens, we could look into this character's house. We would watch him morning, noon, night. We could see, even in pitch black, we could see what he was actually doing. Daytime, in colour, we could see uh, what he's having for breakfast, if he's having a cooked breakfast, whether he's having cornflakes, whether he's um, children ready for school. Is this a live camera you're trying to put in it's, place? It is, yes. Transmitting live pictures? Live pictures, going back... Okay via microwave link to Portadown. So people in Portadown can sit and watch a senior IRA suspect going about his business? His day-to-day -day business. Or his not-so-day-to-day -day business. However covert the techniques, there were few the IRA did not know about. Cameras were found in fields, bugs in houses, and tracking devices in cars. but most remained in place, transmitting vital intelligence on the IRA. The effect was devastating. What did the technology enable British intelligence to do? Effectively, I think, to bring the IRA to a standstill where it could move very, very little. I think that's what te technology done. Uh, that's what the intelligence services were able to do. I think they were able to to effectively uh, stop the IRA, and not saying defeat the IRA, but certainly effectively to stop it. Contain them? To contain it, yeah. yeah. By the early 90s, British intelligence had dealt the IRA a series of crushing blows. The policy of attrition and containment was paying off. The IRA's leadership knew it now had a choice to carry on killing and dying or talk. Why did the IRA decide to talk? I think for a whole range of reasons. I think in terms of those who headed the Republican movement, there was a realisation that if they cannot be defeated by military means alone, then neither can they win by military means alone. I think prominent IRA people came to the conclusion that uh, the, the British military regime could not be defeated. Though there had to be negotiations and that was the only way through it. Did the operations of the police and the army, in particular the covert units of both, force the IRA down that road? I think undoubtedly that was a factor in the equation. It wasn't the only factor, but I think it was a very important factor. There were many reasons why the IRA finally decided to come to the negotiating table, although there's no doubt that the undercover operations of British intelligence did play a powerful part in that process. But what must not be forgotten is that after the hunger strike and the election of its leader Bobby Sands to Westminster, the IRA intended to go down that road anyway, through its political wing, Sinn Féin. The conclusion we came to was that terrorism would end when the terrorists decide to end it. 
that meant uh, trying to uh, show uh, to the terrorists that their existing policy of, uh, as Jerry Adams put it, the Armalite in the ballot box was mistaken, and that the Armalite uh, should be put on one side, and if the terrorists wanted to make progress, they could not make progress through a terrorist campaign, but Republicans could make progress uh, through using the political process. Uh, and that was the essence of the emerging strategy at the end of the 80s. By early 1991, the pieces were beginning to fall into place. Putting them together involved the government in the most sensitive operation of all, communicating with the IRA. It was done in the utmost secrecy. The ground was laid by the MI6 officer Michael Oatley. He'd negotiated the IRA ceasefire in the mid-70s and helped end the first hunger strike. He now re-emerged from the shadows. It did seem um, during 1990-1991 early part that um, that there might be a mood developing within the provisional leadership where a political strategy as an alternative to violence might be something that they would consider pursuing. So Martin McGuinness agreed to meet me in Northern Ireland. How did Martin McGuinness strike you? Well, I hadn't met him before, um, and I was I was very considerably impressed by his um, firmness of manner. I thought he was an, an obviously an intelligent interlocutor, rather in some ways rather like talking to um, a middle-ranking British Army officer of one of the tougher regiments like the Paras or the SAS. Although Oatley had not been authorised to meet McGuinness, he told the government what he had done. MI5 then officially took over. In 1993, the government received a dramatic message, allegedly from McGuinness himself. It said, the conflict is over, but we need your advice on how to end it. It had to be taken extremely seriously, and uh, certainly not dismissed equally. It was important not to uh, fall into a trap if uh, a sensible analysis suggested that there might be one. So it was looked at extremely carefully and explored. But the secret exchanges ended when the IRA bombed a fish shop on the Protestant Shankill Road. Their target was loyalist paramilitaries thought to be meeting upstairs. They were not. Ten people died in the blast, including one of the bombers. Jerry Adams carried the bomber's coffin. The Prime Minister, John Major, made no secret of his feelings about talking to Adams. I can only say that would turn my stomach over and that of most people in this house, and we will not do it. Yet this was the man with whose organization the government had been conducting a secret dialogue for over two years. Within days of the Shankill bomb, the secret contacts were dramatically revealed. Mayhew faced the press. Were you nervous? Oh, of course. Of course. Because uh, they, uh, there they all were, you know, slavering for blood. A good opportunity to screw this minister. Here he is uh, uh, on the most tender of all subjects, and it looks as though he's been negotiating when he said he hadn't. Nobody has been authorised to undertake talks or negotiations on behalf of the government with the IRA, with Sinn Féin, with any organization that undertakes uh, terrorism, undertakes violence for political purposes. Perfectly true, I said we hadn't been negotiating. I never said that there had been no conversation of any sort. And so that was uh, a very difficult time. After much further bloodletting on both sides, the IRA finally declared a ceasefire. The Loyalist paramilitaries soon followed suit. But the government was not convinced that the IRA was sincere and demanded assurances that its ceasefire was permanent. The Brits were not going to lower their guard. Covert operations still had to go ahead. And what was the IRA doing during its ceasefire? 
it was targeting various um, organisations, people uh, from IUC, opposing organisations, tit for tat sect sectarian targeting, and planning operations for future. So during the ceasefire, you carried on with your operations? Yes, we did. The IRA ceasefire held, but the political talks it had been led to believe would follow did not materialise. The rank and file grew impatient, in particular in South Armagh. Increasingly, the IRA felt they'd been duped by the Brits. There was fr certainly frustration at grassroots. They saw normality return to the province and for what they described as for no benefit to the provisional movement. Uh, and actually they were rapidly being ignored by the vast majority. Uh, and therefore they had to do something to restore their impact, to put pressure on the politicians um, to bring them to the negotiating table. The impact came in the heart of London's Docklands and it was massive. However far-reaching the intelligence umbrella, the Brits were unable to anticipate the IRA's every move. In a liberal democracy, where terrorists are prepared to flaunt and abuse the freedoms provided in that liberal democracy, then it's not difficult to carry out such attacks. And sadly, perfect protection against such attacks is not possible. The hopes of the emerging peace process were shattered in a night. Hardly the best start for the new head of the anti-terrorist squad. At midnight on the Friday, due to start on the Monday, I was in the Docklands looking at half a billion pounds worth of criminal damage, two deaths, 70 GBHs, another 300 odd injuries of one kind or another. And when you're standing there in the debris, about to start the new job, what goes through your mind? Well, I suppose you wouldn't be human if you didn't ask yourself, gosh, where do I start here, looking at the scale of the devastation? Grieve and his team then profiled the vehicle that had delivered the bomb. By studying motorway surveillance cameras, they tracked its journey from Carlisle to London. The public was then asked to help. About the 300th call out of 800 from the public uh, was somebody who said, your bomb truck was parked outside my business on a piece of waste, wasteland and there is material still here after three or four days that I think they threw off the vehicle. And out of that we found clues to the bomb truck's route and eventually to its delivery mechanism. The breakthrough came from three sets of thumbprints, all belonging to the bomber, the triple thumbprint man. But his identity remained a mystery, at least for the time being. With the ceasefire shattered, the Brits faced a renewed IRA campaign. In South Armagh, a single-shot sniper became the soldier's deadly nightmare. He'd already killed nine members of the security forces. One had been lucky to survive. His helmet took the force of the high-velocity round. I was actually shot through the helmet, grazing the head. Uh, I do remember my neck being taken well and truly back, as well as my whole body. Um, and the one, one other thing that sticks in my mind is the taste. <clears throat> um, it's, bit, it's not like a carbon taste, if it was taste from the round, or taste, you know, from the helmet, whether bits had flown off. But I can always remember this sort of horrible carbon taste. It's not quite the same as a, a gun powder taste you would get from around going off or whatever, but a terrible taste. 
what was the psychological impact on soldiers of the sniper? I think the sniper had quite a major impact. You never knew where it was going to come from. You got virtually no warning. The fact that the sniper was very successful, that if he fired, in the majority of cases, you were killed, that clearly had, a, had an impact. I think it's the, the fact that you suddenly realise that somebody is there to kill you. You know, it, it doesn't sort of hit you when you have shoots before, but when, with it being a sniper, it's one to one. Well, it's not even one to one, you, you haven't got the, the chance that he's, he has. But for somebody to pick you up and say, right, you're, you're the one, you're going to die, that's um, been the hardest thing, I think. The five foot long Barrett sniper rifle was mounted in the back of a Mazda and fired from behind a hinged armoured plate. Stephen Restoric was unemployed and desperately wanted a job, so he joined the army. He was a typical young 23 year old. He was just so full of life, he, you know, and he was so outgoing as well, you know, he'd, he'd talk to anybody. He knew it was the last thing I wanted him to do, but um, it was his life and he just saw it as a, a good career. In February 1997, Stephen was manning a checkpoint in the village of Bessbrook in South Armagh. He was checking a woman's driving licence when the sniper squeezed the trigger. And when you heard what had happened? Um, I think it's the usual reaction of anybody who hears the same thing. It's just total disbelief. Slowly, you know, I mean, I just, when the policeman told me, I just said, no, it's not true, it's not true. And, um, you know, from there you have to make the, well, what I would say, the hardest journey anyone have, has to make. The intelligence agencies had their suspicions as to who the sniper team were. The problem was getting the evidence. Gradually, over long months, 14 intelligence company, the debt, helped build up the picture. If you can't stand outside your own base without getting hit by a sniper, then it's uh, pretty poor doings. So, yes, a lot of effort was put into um, capturing the, the sniper teams and find out who they were. Covert technical surveillance in such a hostile environment was enormously difficult, and the debt's ingenuity was stretched to the limit. You would be picking out things at night in daytime, what you could probably use to disguise the cameras, whether it be an old Wellington boot that lays there, or a rock, a significant rock. You would a then, rock. yeah, you would photograph the rock with infrared, take it back, uh, and try and replicate that rock as best as you can, and replace that rock with a another one with a camera hidden in it. So the camera is hidden inside inside a rock, yeah. Presumably, the operation that you were involved in was replicated all, all over the place, all, all across, to find out exactly who it was. Yeah. So all the suspects were identified, identified, monitored, monitored, movements known, yeah, watched, recorded, Tr recorded, and acted upon, yeah, as and when required. Intelligence pinpointed a border farm where the team were preparing a shoot. Four IRA men were getting their vehicles ready when the SAS swooped and made the arrest. In the search, they found the rifle's lethal ammunition and, in the end, the rifle itself, concealed under the floor of a horse box. We'd caught them. We'd caught them red-handed. Uh, we'd struck a blow, the first proper blow, probably for 20 years, against South Amapara, who had almost thought they had become invincible. Um, we'd struck right at the heart of their 
at the heart of their morale uh, and their feeling of invincibility. Um, it was a great feeling for all the members of the army and for the police because we'd worked a long time, a long time to achieve this. Um, we'd lost if a bombardier restric uh, a couple of months before, um, and we really felt that this was uh, one back for him. It brought about quite a degree of shock on the part of the IRA to be arrested right in their own backyard, so to speak, where they felt a certain degree of relaxation uh, to find that here they were arrested and their weapons seized. The IRA weren't actually holding weapons at the time of the arrest. Unlike previous allegations of shoot to kill, in this case no shots were fired. Above all, I think the fact that we had arrested them um, and not shot them, not killed them, not killed them, um, was, I think, very important as well because uh, it sent a message that there weren't going to be any martyrs. Uh, they'd been caught red-handed. Uh, they were going to go down, uh, that they were no longer invincible. One of those arrested was Seamus McArdle. He wasn't just a member of the sniper team, he was also the elusive triple thumbprint man behind the Docklands bomb. John Greaves' mystery was solved. I was actually at a, at a rock concert one night, and my pager went off right at the end of it, and it was a message to call my contacts in the IUC urgently, and it was clear even from the pager message that they were very excited about something. The sniper team was tried and convicted in Belfast and sentenced to long years in prison. The irony is that following the election of Tony Blair, a second IRA ceasefire and the signing of the Good Friday Agreement, the sniper team will soon be released. Such is the price of the hoped-for peace. In Belfast, Rita Restoric was in court to see her son's killers tried and convicted. Those who were sentenced for the killing of your son and others too will be released very shortly under the Good Friday Agreement. How do you feel about that, to see your son's killers go free and the killers of others? It's very hard, like it is for all the other people who are having to see this happen. But if we could be sure that this route we're taking works and there'd be no more killing, then it's something we have to accept. At the moment, there's no guarantee that the route will work. For years, the stumbling block to cementing a lasting peace has been the IRA's refusal to hand over or destroy its weapons. That's what the British government and the Ulster Unionists have always demanded. But for the IRA, it's been a step too far. Why is it so illogical to ask the IRA to decommission its arsenal if the IRA is really interested in peace? Decommissioning is one of these dishonest words, isn't it? Rather like calling the Ministry of War the Ministry of Defence. And decommissioning means hand in your weapons, um, which is, after all, the traditional, um, the traditional mark of de defeat. Defeated armies stack their weapons and walk off into prison camps. And I think it's um, established in the history of Irish rebellion that this is not something you do. If you decide to end your campaign, you stick your gun uh, somewhere in the roof and continue to lead a, a peaceful life, but you don't go and hand it in. Any organization which has support and financial support and chooses violence can get hold of weapons and token handing over of weapons is really meaningless 
that is politically counterproductive. The restoration of the executive and the return of Martin McGuinness as Minister for Education is reason for optimism. It's happened because the IRA was prepared to open its bunkers for inspection. But the gesture doesn't impress many who spent their lives putting McGuinness's colleagues behind bars. To them, opening up bunkers isn't the same as giving up guns. You just cannot have um, a bunch of terrorists, and uh, I, I feel probably once a terrorist, always a terrorist, a bunch of terrorists wandering around, and if, if they get a bit sad and they throw their teddy bear in the corner, they can just go out and get their, their armour light or their AK-47 and, uh, and pick up where they left off, be it in five years' time or ten years' time. I feel there cannot be a political solution. Well, as they have been described so many times, the men of violence still have their weapons, their tools of violence. For now, the peace process is back on track. Hundreds of soldiers are preparing to go home. They believe their job has been done. What has the army achieved? 600 killed, 6,000 wounded, um, 30 years of experience. I think what we have achieved uh, is that we've held the line. We've contained terrorism to allow a wider strategic political plan to be developed and implemented. Um, and I think we've done that job pretty well. If the peace process moves to its conclusion, these soldiers will be the first of many to leave. Much rides on the IRA's statement that it will put its arms completely and verifiably beyond use. We are where we are today because the Brits pursued their own armor light and ballot box strategy tough security matched by political initiatives. After 30 years, the Brits have not defeated the IRA, but forced it to face political reality. In the light of the IRA's recent statement, do you believe that the war is over? That's a very significant statement. It goes further than anything we've heard publicly from them before. I think it's amazing, and to the credit of all the parties in Northern Ireland, that we've made the progress we have. I think we delude ourselves if we think that the process of healing and of finding a peaceful way forward is yet complete. What I can say with confidence and optimism is that we'll never go back to the dark days. The public of Northern Ireland won't have to go back to the dark days, and public further afield won't have to go back to the dark days. They had to endure for almost 30 years. Maybe too soon to say the war is over. I think we can say the war is ending.